Good afternoon and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. We're live streaming from the Boathouse at Confluence Park. My name's Jane Scott and it's truly a pleasure and a privilege to serve as the president and the CEO of the Columbus Metropolitan Club and to welcome to you our forum this afternoon. Today's forum is supported by the Crane Group and Grange Insurance. And our live stream partners for our special report series are NBC4, NBC4i, WOSU Public Media, PNC, the Tom E. Daly Foundation, Morpsey, Dispatch Media Group, and OSU Wexner Medical Center. Organizations that provide basic assistance, food and shelter, have seen an explosion of need. They've been slammed. Hundreds of people are working tirelessly and methodically to fill these crucial needs. While nonprofit leaders and funders in our community have rallied to address the immediate crises, we know the long-term picture is troubling. So let's hear from two people who represent many of the frontline providers. Please welcome President and CEO of United Way of Central Ohio, Dr. Lisa Cordes. President and CEO, Life Care Alliance, Chuck Gehring. And hosting our forum is Emmy Award-winning journalist, host of NBC4, The Spectrum, and a CMC board member, Colleen Marshall. Colleen, we look forward to the conversation. It's all yours, folks. All right, thank you so much, and welcome to both of you. And Lisa, I'm going to start with you. Jane touched on it. These are troubling times for families, certainly for businesses, but nonprofits face a different kind of challenge, don't they? Because they rely on the health of the community to support them. What's the overall picture for our nonprofits right now? Well, that's right, <laughs> they do. So we're concerned two, twofold regarding the nonprofit sector. One is we need a strong sector. We need that strong safety net right now. And these are also businesses that have to run. And they need to work differently now because of social distancing, which is expensive. And because of social distancing, so many of their revenue sources have been either cut off or really reduced. For example, you can't hold a big fundraiser in this room today like we right. would have. It's an empty room, it's an we empty point room. out to everyone. Right. 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 So in partnership with the Human Service Chamber, we're regularly um, surveying our nonprofit partners to understand what these threats are, because we need them to be strong. But all but 10% of those surveyed have had significant reductions in their revenue sources. So that's a very big concern. And then the stressors of having their staff on the front lines, really putting their own lives um, at risk in terms of being able to catch the virus um, is, a, is, a, is a huge stressor for supervisors and employees, families of these frontline workers. I mean, truly, they are our heroes right now, but their business models are under significant threats. And certainly Life Care Alliance, Chuck, has dealt with the frontline concerns. For one thing, so many of your people go into the homes of elderly every day, so they're having that direct contact keeping in touch with people who are mm -hmm. desperately needing the food that you supply, mm -hmm. but also you rely a lot on volunteers and they may mm -hmm. not be eager to go out door to door and what, going from house to house to house. What, what have been the problems that you're seeing that you never expected to no. be dealing with this year? Well, uh, just to tell you, we did over three million in-home touches of clients last year. Um, that's a unique, issue and if you don't know we are the meals on wheels provider here in central ohio and we of charity agencies around the country we happen to be the largest of the meals on wheels providers but we also do in-home care et cetera, et cetera. What has been interesting, Colleen, I think, has been the response from the community. We have garnered over 1,400 new people who are volunteering for wow. us right now to get out and do things. Uh, I think what's interesting, too, is that we have home health aides who go out and basically what home health aides do is they are bathing people to make sure they can get in and out of the bathtub and have a bath. We've only had four clients call in this whole time and say, don't come for that. So I think it's an amazing thing. Um, but I would tell you, Colleen, that one thing that we did, we were part of a pandemic planning group in central Ohio about a dozen years ago. And a lot of people don't remember this. 
but we put a lot of procedures in place. So we have tried to put procedures in place to safeguard those volunteers and our paid employees as they take the services out each day. For example, if the client is able to at least come out their front door and pick up a meal, we're putting the meal on the porch calling them because we have the numbers on the route sheets and saying the meal's sitting there come out and get it they come out and get it we are 30 feet down the sidewalk at that point in time and can talk to them now i will confess though that we have an awful lot of people in beds and wheelchairs that just can't do that but we have worked around that the best we can and everybody's getting served every day you, you mentioned talking to them at the end of the sidewalk. So much of what you do, and I have done some volunteer deliveries for your organization, and so much of it is these people are seeing someone once a day, and they want to hug. I mean, I'm, I hugged more people yeah. that day, I think, than I've ever <laughs> hugged anyone because they want to talk to you and yeah. have some human contact. Yeah. How difficult it must be yeah. for these volunteers who are, from the goodness of their heart, yeah. hugging people every day. It, it, this is a challenge at a time like this. It's a big challenge, but I will tell you, our clients in the home uh, are afraid. Uh, they're afraid that if they get coronavirus, they could die because they are, we serve seniors and medically challenged individuals, and they are the most at-risk group. So they're afraid to do anything. They won't go to the stores. They won't do anything. But we have heard lately, uh, we're getting a lot of statistics on this, that uh, the big issue with folks now, they've always been sequestered. And they've always told us that they only see our workers on a regular weekly basis, but now they haven't seen anybody for two months. And they're really getting to the point there, the depression's starting to hit them a little bit. So that daily visit with a meal is a big deal. It's their celebration of the day, uh, other than watching you on the news at night, <laughs> Colleen. And, uh, but it's, um, you know, it's getting tiring for them, but they're hanging in and they will be okay. This is a strong community and they will get through this. Well, you know, Lisa, he touched on they're, they're getting depressed and this is, this is what they look forward to every day. The other thing that's happening is the need, the demands for services are just continue to rise as more people face unemployment or maybe a cut in pay. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing the stress for your nonprofits yeah. at the time when the demands on their services are really skyrocketing. Right. So demands are high, but I've been saying regularly that I really believe we'll look back on this and say this is the calm before the tsunami. Mm -hmm. A couple of um, you know f factors that I see. One is this hunkering down, this stay at home uh, mandate. People are doing it. They're hunkering down. And so there are some services that our community is prepared to give, and we haven't seen the access to it like we're going to see the access to it. And I'll give you an example. Uh, and, one, and families have received stimulus checks, which have been very helpful, right? But that's not gonna last for, well, there'll be another round of those, but this is, the, the demand is gonna get higher and higher. So as an example, the, our domestic violence emergency shelter had, had uh, was not fully occupied and we're all wondering why well there's something about hunkering down at home and if you're in a controlling environment to begin with as a domestic violence victim you might not leave your home right you might not feel one it's not safe to go out and your partner's not making it safe to go out well, a week ago, Monday, our domestic violence shelter received the largest number of calls it had ever received in its history in one day. So we also know that evictions, our city has been great to put a moratorium on evictions, and that gets lifted on June 1st. Our utility companies are very generous, saying you don't have to pay your payments until the end of June. But these bills are going to come due, and the demand is going to get that much higher. And I'm, we're all very concerned as we prepare for this high demand. What specific nonprofits do you think are going to be f feeling this strain? If this tsunami hits, who's really going to be under the gun? Well, I will say, you know, the good news is when you hear from Matt Habash, who runs the Mid-Ohio Food Bank, he would say, we have plenty of food. Even if you've never had to receive free food before, come get it now. Save your money for rent and utilities and other bills that you need to have 
to make for your family. Come get food. We have it. It's a lot of fresh food. But there are organizations like the Columbus Urban League and Impact that um, are helping people with rental assistance. So there's high demand there. Hundreds and hundreds of people calling a day for advice about rental assistance. And then our shelter system, which has been remarkable what our emergency shelter system has done during this time, and the collaboration among and between the community shelter board, the YWCA, the YMCA. When you think about shelter, it has, the model has been about how many people can we get in a small enough envir environment so we can make this cost effective. And with social distancing, all of the residents in shelter had to be six feet apart. And so to watch our shelter system navigate that and bring online new shelters has been remarkable. And have people be safe and six feet apart and then to open shelters where if residents in a shelter were showing symptoms of the virus, they could be quarantined. It's been remarkable. But what happens if these thousands of people who are up for eviction have to enter that shelter system? It, it will be a tsunami. And Chuck, you mentioned you did pandemic planning a, d a dozen years ago, mm -hmm. but the reality of this is here. Mm -hmm. What is your day-to-day -day operation now compared to what it was even three months ago? How was it different? Well, it's uh, been a wild ride. I've been doing this uh, in this role for 19 years now, and I've never seen it like this. We're up, uh, our meals alone are up 63% since March 1st, um, which is literally hundreds upon hundreds of meals a day. We've converted parts of our building into a depot, basically, to get meals out every day, um, to get them into the community and things like that for people. Um, some of our stuff has had to shut down. But a lot of it's still going, and uh, um, you know we just have to do the best we can. So people have been very supportive and good about this. They you wear masks. Uh, nobody's come in the building trying to do anything dumb. Uh, they wear their masks. They're distancing. They're washing their hands. And uh, we've been blessed, uh, knock on wood, that uh, we haven't had these situations occur in our place yet. You say up 63%. Put a number on that for me. How many well, meals are going out the door every day? Well, if we continue on this pace, we're going to do probably another six to 700,000 meals this year. Um, there's um, about 5,000 meals going out the door every day. In addition to, we have a specialty pantry for cancer victims, uh, and we're feeding the whole family. That's a whole other uh, situation. They're up 52%. So. It is just, uh, if you come to our Harmon Avenue building in the morning, I mean, it looks, it's a parking lot. And I mean, there's so many people there to help and volunteer. And we, we have to background check them and things like that, as you can imagine, can't just let them go into the house. But it's gonna get worse. I thought the numbers about two weeks ago started to level off a little bit of new clients coming in. I was wrong, they're coming back up again. And uh, we're taking everybody. But, you know, one point I want to make today is there was a national survey done on Meals on Wheels groups, just as an example. And they just did this, and they learned that 55% of programs nationally have increased wait lists that already existed. And 22% um, of those programs' wait lists have doubled or more. Prior to coronavirus, we were probably the only group in the top 50 markets in the country without a wait list for the program. Everybody else had a wait list because of money. Well, now those wait lists are just getting bigger. We're still taking everybody. And uh, we want to do that. We want to help out. But it's getting, it's getting wild. But we have capacity. And we're, uh, the staff is just dedicated to getting this done. And we're going to get it done. So what's your secret? If the other big cities around the country have a long waiting list, what's your secret from, for well, getting everyone fed? There are Chuck is the secret. Uh, no, Chuck <laughs> is not the secret. But there are five things we do. We have probably the highest volunteer rate in the country, which saves us the cost of a paid driver. We get paid the same regardless. We fundraise a lot. We do a lot of crazy things. We have a catering company that's down right now that we don't get any revenue off of, but it helps with revenue and things like that. But you just have to do a lot of different things to be able to support the financial model. And uh, we've been very fortunate here. And I would tell you through the coronavirus, um, you know, 63% more meals, that you gotta buy the food, you gotta buy the packaging. You got to buy, it's, we spend $50,000 every time we get a shipment of trays in to put the meals in. Um, 
the City of Columbus, uh, Mayor Ginther and City Council have stepped up, the county commissioners have stepped up, United Way has stepped up, and there's been a, a, just a plethora of community foundations, the Columbus Foundation and then corporate foundations, who have stepped up to help us through this financially. And uh, uh, without them, it wouldn't be happening. Do you I'll foresee the you. day where you may have to say to someone, oh, sorry, yeah. we don't have food for you? Well, we were getting close a year or so ago, and we've just um, really pushed hard through that. Uh, uh, I just don't want to get there. That would kill me personally. And uh, we just don't want to do that. You know, Lisa, he talked on funding and $50,000 for a truck of trays. Mm -hmm. This time of year, I'm sure you both know this, so many organizations are doing their annual fundraisers. Mm -hmm. This is so unusual that yeah. I'm not spending my Saturday nights and Sunday afternoons raising money for charity. Mm -hmm. Everything that I was committed to was canceled. So I can imagine oh, that galas and mm -hmm. walks and fundraising raffles are just have to be shelved. So now you've got increased demand, mm -hmm. fewer resources, and calls every day to the United Way, we need help. Right. So what's the solution here? Well, I, I will uh, echo what Chuck said. You know, the community has stepped up and made significant contributions. We, we've had um, a phenomenal response to our COVID relief fund the United Way has been running. And we're so grateful to corporate sponsors and individuals that have stepped up. So we've, we've seen record numbers of monies raised. There'll be an end to that, right? And we have to go into recovery. Um, I think we're going to have to look at the funding models differently and know that in the future, I don't know if we can rely so much. We're an event-driven town, and I don't know if we can rely on these events anymore. But in the short term this year, public funding, federal funding is a mandate. It has to be there to support us. Philanthropy is great because it's nimble, it's quick, it can fill in but it is not at the volume of funding that we need that the government will, will support, is supporting. There's been significant flow already, just looking at, for example, the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, then the stimulus packages have, have not been all that they need to be, but that money is flowing and the federal money has to be there for us. Well, corporations, I imagine, are also leery of making commitments to nonprofits right now because they don't know what their bottom line is going to be at the end of the year. And you mentioned event-driven. It's an event-driven city because so many corporations here are willing to underwrite fundraisers and write those big checks. Mm -hmm. Can you foresee that money drying up? I can see it changing. I will say that our corporate community is pretty phenomenal and have raised their hands right now to be as supportive as they can. And they've come back again and given more. Um, but, you know, we don't, we're taking this a week at a time because we don't know what the next month is going to bring. But in this last two months, the corporate community has delivered for our community. I, I see you nodding your head. Is mm -hmm. that something that you're relying on more than oh, ever? Oh, heavens yes. I mean, these emergency funds that have been established are amazing. Just two things I would tell you. There, some of them are, are, are pretty good. We've got a report going out tomorrow to one funder who was very generous to us who asked for comparative balance sheets for our agency. I, wow. think, I think that's from last year to this year. I think that's smart. I think that's smart that they're looking at what's your cash burn? Are you going to be around to do these kinds of things? The second thing is the, uh, in the 2.2 Federal uh, CARES Act, $2.2 trillion Federal CARES Act, there was additional federal money in there, for example, for Meals on Wheels. Uh, we used half of it up in the month of April, <laughs> wow. just so you know, and we'll use the rest of it up in May. So. Um, Hopefully there will be some additional monies. I agree with Dr. Lisa that, um, you know, my problem is not today. My problem is in September. What kind of a problem do you envision in September? It, let's say this pandemic goes on. We heard you know, Dr. Fauci talking earlier this week about the earliest he could foresee a vaccine would be winter. Mm -hmm. This isn't, he doesn't see it before kids are ready to go back mm -hmm. to school. So let's say we're in this for the long haul. How do you envision your funding and your mission going as we head into mm -hmm. the autumn months? Well, we're pretty committed at our place, but uh, the funding's got to keep coming. And uh, if the numbers keep coming, 
and we'll report on that. We report on that to all our funders and things like that, but there is a bottom to what people can do. And uh, there's a bottom to what the corporations can do. There's a bottom to what United Way can do. And um, so we just got to look at those. Uh, at that point in time, you'll see more layoffs uh, than the not-for-profit sector has already seen. And you'll see some, I'm sure you'll see a closure or two. I mean, it's just what's going to happen. And, uh, but we'll keep fighting through this. And, you know, this is one of those things you really can't, uh, I had somebody ask me, have you done cash projections through the end of the year? And I said, yeah, and they're not any good because <laughs> nobody knows, you know, it's, it's just numbers on a piece of paper right now as to tell me what the numbers are gonna be, what the problem's gonna be, um, and how the funding's gonna be. So uh, you take this week by week, month by month, but right, you know, we're getting through this and we will get through this. Lisa, you're nodding your head over yeah. there, but I know you are the umbrella organization for a lot of nonprofits. Right. Uh, people are saying there are going to be some nonprofits that just cannot sustain themselves through this. Who's in trouble right now? Well, the arts. The arts are in trouble, right? So we're, we're really, we are a human service uh, focused organization, but we certainly all care and know how important all of our nonprofits are. And, and Franklin County alone, we have 14,000 nonprofits. But when you think, I know Broadway uh, announced today that it will not have any any programming this summer until, I guess, fall. But our arts community is, has really been struggling. The uh, Greater uh, Columbus Arts Council and Tom Katzenmeyer have certainly stepped up and been raising money for artists. But um, without their revenue generating ticket purchasing um, business model. Yeah, so that's one we, example. When you think of Picnic with the Pops and the art programs, this is a vibrant arts community. Yeah. And it's not just the art that you hang on the wall, We're, of course the arts festivals, but um, there are a lot of local artists and there are a lot of local performers and we've got the symphony and, and right. the opera and we, we are an arts loving town. We are. But when people have to decide, am I going to support the arts or put food on the table, this is gonna be a struggle. Absolutely, and, and, and to that point about you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and our wanting to make certain that people have the food and the shelter that they need, which is primary, right? We're really worried about kids. Mm -hmm. And you can't quantify that right now, but the trauma that a family is going through right now and the numbers of children that live in poverty in our community and who, because of the barriers that poverty presents, are already behind in their development and in school. And now they haven't been in school for several months. And summer programs, the governor has not announced what summer programming will look like and can we have summer programming for, for, for children to support families. Child care is not back up and running. Without child care, families can't go to work. It's really, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's devastating to think about what those impacts might be. And so I know that organizations like the Boys and Girls Club or Big Brothers Big Sisters recognize how important food is and shelter, but don't forget about those support services for kids. But if they can't get to the support services, if they can't be together, uh, my sisters were both teachers, they're retired now, but I had a conversation with one of them who said, can you imagine I was a special ed teacher. If they had told me I had to keep small children away from each other all day, right. it would be impossible. Or to wear a mask all day. Right. right, to keep a mask on a child. I can't even imagine what for children and families this is going to look like and what do we need to be prepared once this pandemic ends, let's say next spring if we're in a better place they're still gonna be dealing with the, effect, the after effects of this for children on learning and trauma, aren't they? Absolutely, and what we've seen is, uh, one, just a, you know, we knew there was a digital divide. We do not have broadband across our city, so not everyone has access to broadband. So those who have more means have more opportunity for virtual experiences, and there are just lots of children who can't access their lessons at home because they don't have a computer, or there are five children in a family, and they have one computer, while all the children need to be learning in that group. So one, one um, initiative that we're working on that we're, we'll soon announce um, is United for Kids and thinking about how we can make certain that kids have access to tools and games and fun for the summer that will can support them but also support families. 
um, because we need to keep them engaged and learning. And think about learning loss that happens in the summer, even when you do go to camp and you're not in school. <laughs> and if you don't have any of those services this year, um, we're really concerned about that. And, and Chuck, you're at the other end of the spectrum. You are dealing with a mostly elderly population who already, in a lot of ways, have been left behind. They're reaching out to you. You mentioned some of them see no one during the week, but your volunteers. So mm -hmm. what is the psychological impact for that group of our neighbors? Well, it's huge uh, because depression hits them anyway. Even without coronavirus, they, depression hits them and they don't see people oftentimes. But you know, much of the 63% increase in the meals we've got right now are from people that had supports prior to this, but uh, the daughter or nephew or whoever doesn't come in every other Saturday to take them to Kroger. Um, yeah. So it becomes an issue and uh, they're just not seeing anybody right now. And I would tell you that we've researched our seniors over the years, um, less than 10% of our folks that we service have a computer in their house. Okay, and some of them, I, I deliver to a lady on the west side, she has an, a computer that's from, I think Bill Gates worked on it himself <laughs> years ago, but she plays games on it, and that's, it was given to her by her kids. She plays Pac-Man on it, and she says it's a lot of company for me. And there's things like that, but there comes a point where that gets a little uh, problematic, and I am concerned this summer, we run a fan campaign in the summer where we get fans yeah. with your help oftentimes, because uh, a lot of the folks can't, don't have air conditioning, can't afford to turn it on, and we always say to the reporters that come out to interview us on this, check, tell everybody to check on their elderly and infirmed neighbors, because in the summertime, it's as bad as the winter. I mean, you can, heat stroke, heat exhaustion, things like that are a big issue. If I can too, we also, we are primarily seniors in medical challenges, but we prepare a lot of kids meals because we have two industrial kitchens. A big point is gonna come about June 15th of this year because that's when these summer meal programs open up for the kids. And you know, schools provide free and low cost meals for breakfast and lunch for just thousands of kids in our, tens of thousands of kids in our community. Well, they haven't been getting those. They had the sites, but they haven't been getting them. In the summer, those programs have got to open up in some way or, or another. I mean, we can box up a, a package meal for them but those kids, uh, I'm worried about the kids too. We've got to get that food to them so that they have healthy meals. You know, a, a child is perfectly happy having a bag of potato chips to eat, but that doesn't help them. So we've got to, hopefully this will all open up. The daycare will open up. The daycares, as Dr. Lisa was saying, will open up. And we can, June 15th is like D-Day on those summer meal feeding programs. And we provide a lot of meals for those. We do the YMCA, the Urban League, places like that. It's got to open and we got to get those meals to those kids. But what does that look like? You say it's got to open. We're hearing all these restrictions. Is it safe <laughs> to have volunteers working side by side, yeah. making these meals, getting them out the well, door, having families come and pick them up? Mm -hmm. what, what is all this going to look like as we head into summer? Well, I, I visited one program yeah. this morning, uh, the Westerville Area Resource Ministries, WARM, is a food pantry and they have a number of feeding programs throughout the summer and they have just committed to doing grab and go and they were pack they were packaging the things that they could now to prepare for grab and go but they it used to be a holistic program where there were games played and they stayed for some time and there was learning it's just going to be about picking up a meal well that doesn't support a family a mother or a father who has to go to work Someone's got to take the child there to grab it and go. So it, it'll be so challenging mm -hmm. for our community like we've never seen before. And, you know, child care, we hope, will open up soon. But it was, it's likely going to have ratios that we haven't seen before, which just required ratios, which are very costly. Child care is not a money-making business to begin with. And when you have to increase your ratios, teacher to children, it becomes cost prohibitive. Uh, there's a study that's reporting that when this is all said and done this year, next year we'll have less than half of our current supply of child care providers in our community. And yet people need to go back to work. So we're talking about a lot of very serious problems. So each of you 
if someone's watching and they, they're thinking, okay, I'm not working right now, I don't have a lot of money, but I might be able to help. What, what, should, what do you need from us, from the community at this point? Well, I need, we always, I think a lot of agencies need volunteers. I need a lot of volunteers. There's a number of agencies in the United Way system and just around the, uh, the, the city that need volunteers. So find what you're passionate at and call them and see if you can volunteer. Um, there are ways to do it. It's quick, easy. You can do it on weekends. We're open 365. We've got to deliver on weekends and holidays. We're delivering full bore this year. It's not a holiday meal. It's going to be full bore to everybody on Memorial Day uh, and the 4th of July. So, um, you know, just investigate. It's quick and easy. You can do it. It it's going to cost you $3 probably. Gas is cheap to drive around now. So, uh, you know, I, I, I say volunteer and get out there. If you don't have the money to give, just volunteer and you can, you can change lives. You will save lives. And there's not a lot of stuff that you can talk about with that. You know, the hospitals, the first responders, the EMS folks, God love them for doing what they're doing. But you can change lives by volunteering for groups like some of the non-for-profits in the community. I see you nodding your head over there, Lisa. Well, we have what's called Volunteer United, so I encourage people to go and find out about volunteer opportunities at uh, Chuck's organization. But also there are lots of ways to do virtual volunteering, and we have those listed as well. Um, when I visited Warm this morning, they said Ohio Health um, associates had been writing notes that they could put in the bags of food that they're giving to people and how much people loved reading these personal notes. Mm -hmm and th having Ohio Health share their stories of what's happening there. So, um, but I do think unrestricted giving is really important. So there are funds set up like ours, but the Columbus Foundation has one and the big give is coming. If you can give $20, imagine if each of us, we're 1.3 million people in Franklin County, gave an unrestricted gift to an organization, meaning the organization decides how to spend that money. Um, that is really the, biggest gift you can give to a nonprofit so that it can use it for the best the best use and have not having the donor decide what the best use is for it, especially given how strapped they are. You know, you mentioned unrestricted use. Those PPP funds that came in, there are restrictions on them. Uh, you're supposed to use it for payroll, 75%. People don't have people at work right now, and yet it's supposed to be used by the end of June. And we've heard from employers who are saying these restrictions are so narrow that it's not practical for me to be able to use the money the way that we're being ordered. The money that's coming into you in the form of federal grants or help from the government, are the restrictions making it impossible to use it properly, or are you just so grateful to have any money you can get your hands on? Um, the government money we're getting do not have ridiculous restrictions on them at all. Um, it's for something specific like feed more people, things like that for us. It's not an issue at all. The governments have been very good to us with this and in fact have in some cases relaxed some of the restrictions so that we can do more. Um, I've got an SBA CARES Act loan. Um, and I'm using it for payroll because I'm employing people. But, you know, that's a 1% loan. And while if, it, if you're not using it for payroll, you have to pay it back at some point, it is there to help with cash flow. So it's not a perfect situation, but it, it does help a little bit with cash flow. But it's much better if you can get it forgiven or get most of it forgiven. And we'll is, go from there. Is the federal government, Lisa, doing, or the state government give, doing everything you think they can and should be doing at this point for nonprofits? Well, I think the sector has felt left behind in, in many of these allocations, yes. You, are you talking about the big allocations coming out of Washington? Yeah, yeah. How would you like that to change? Oh, well, I mean, there are lots of ways in which we need supported. You know, the, if you just think about the payroll uh, paycheck protection program, it wasn't necessarily meant for nonprofits. It was meant for organizations of certain sizes, right? And just to the, how is it prohibitive? Um, I just want to comment on that for a bit. What's happening is the regulations and rules are are rolling out after we all have re already received our loans. <laughs> That's what the frightening thing is, like what is to come next that we got ourselves into and didn't know we were getting ourselves into. But um, there are you know, uh, huge amounts of monies that our sector has to pay, for example, for unemployment, um, that we need help with. Childcare needs more money. To, I mean, the list goes on and on. But we have great advocates. 
Um, one is the Human Service Chamber, and our, our federal and state um, legislations are doing all that they can, can do. Yep. And I would just, can I just add, I, we have been in contact, our agency, the Human Service Chamber, which if you don't know what that is, it's a group, I helped found it 100 years ago. It's a group <laughs> of 80 not-for-profit organizations that work on these types of things. We've been in contact with our elected officials and they want to know what's going on. Can't always do everything you want, but they want to know and we're, we're able now to get some of these um, smaller pieces out to them and say, here's some things you could do that would make a huge difference that might not cost a billion dollars. And uh, they are listening and they're trying to get them done and they're, um, you know, some of it's happening. I, I want to point out that we have an audience watching us uh, at, at home or wherever they are watching us from, and we're grateful for that. And during this live stream, they've been sending in some questions, and Jane has some of them for us now. I do. Um, Kathy Fox asks, uh, she's from Community Strategy Partners, what innovations have you as nonprofits created for, your, for this emergency that you want to take forward into your continued operations after the pandemic is over? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, on, for us, I can, I can hit this one first, uh, tons of things. Mm -hmm. I think when you have crisis like this, you know, there's a lot of quotes from people, famous people, this is the time you look at yourself and say, what do you do? And, I, and we have, it's too numerous to mention, Kathy, I'll tell you that, uh, I know Kathy, and uh, um, we have looked at every aspect of what we're doing how we're going to deliver the service differently going forward, how we're going to continue to take clients, et cetera, et cetera. But then little things, um, just our packaging, things like that. So we are looking, this is a great time, even though we've been busier than all heck. I mean, we really have been. You know, I've encouraged our staff and they have really taken this under their wings and run with it. How can we do things better and different going forward to save money to become even more efficient and effective than we have? So I think that is happening as best we can in the, in the whole not-for-profit environment. Yeah. Would you agree? Well, I, I do, and I've been, hearing, I've been hearing my colleagues say, now why am I paying all that rent downtown? And do I really need all the people that I have to do the work that we're doing? And look how well we work virtually. So I, I think it's going to change day-to-day -day work. Uh, but if anything, we've, we continue to learn in our sector the digital divide. One, too many of our nonprofits do not have the software and hardware that they need to thrive in a virtual environment. Mm -hmm. And their clients don't have it. So that's an opportunity we know we need to be innovative now and make that happen for our community. This could have an impact on downtown real estate going forward, couldn't it? And, uh, and the other yeah. thing is, you mentioned, do I need all these people? Not just nonprofits, but businesses are right. looking at downsizing. The unemployment problem is just, it's going to be an exponential cycle that you can't, yes. now we're going to have more people needing services. Yes. Right. Yes. But there's but there's going to be some job opportunities and some entrepreneur opportunities. You just yes. got through saying you're going to have half of the child care facilities. Mm -hmm. um, there we're going into the the summer gardening opportunities to raise food for people. Yes. Churches right. are doing gardening. Extension is doing community gardening. I know Mid Ohio Food Bank has gardening. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you know maybe necessity is the mother of invention, right? Yes, so. absolutely. But we yeah. will have record numbers of unemployment yeah. like we haven't seen for generations. Mm -hmm. right. um, Carolyn Caldwell actually has two questions. Raising, she's with Raising Awareness, uh, Raising Funds, LLC. Um, this is directed to you, uh, Lisa. Can you talk about your emergency response grants and when you anticipate that pool of funds being tapped or United Way returning to its normal grant-making cadence and focus? And then the other piece of her question that she sent during the forum here, will nonprofits' financial stability after the pandemic factor into when United Way makes grant funding decisions or support decisions. So I think the two-part question, you know, when are you going back to normal fundraising and when you do make grants, the sustainability of nonprofits will that way into the grant decisions? Well, and our board has encouraged us to say everything's on the table. Like, 
most of us aren't gonna return to life as we knew it before. And so we're taking a look at how can we be uh, better for the community with uh, the monies that we're able to raise. So we are currently, uh, still have monies available in our emergency funds. Uh, we'll be announcing what those uh, future priority areas will be as we consider, we wanna, we've been trying to be thoughtful about understanding the needs in the community because they've changed so rapidly. If we had set out and said, this is how our grant making is going to be for X amount of months and made those decisions in March, well, we would have been wrong because that they, things have changed, it's so unprecedented, no one could predict. So what we would have predicted just didn't materialize. Okay. So we wanna to continue to stay flexible, but we will go, we will charge into this next fundraising season about COVID recovery. It'll all be about COVID. And we will try to align our grant making uh, more to having real time fundraising dollars to allocate. Whereas before we would run a campaign to fund our agency commitments, we're more likely to raise money first and then allocate dollars, uh, which is just smarter, we believe, to do that um, so that we're clear about how much money we actually have to allocate. And I do think the sustainability is going to be a very big question. It already is when we're looking at grantees now. Yeah. Uh, Bill Lafayette asks, how can we ensure the work of nonprofits continues? And I'm gonna add to that Will there be opportunities for nonprofits to consolidate and perhaps merge services, or even nonprofits themselves merge? Do you know that Chuck is the king of merger? <laughs> no. No. <clears throat> well, we've taken on over the years four agencies, and we've taken on four other sort of agencies, I'll tell you, and a whole mess of programming over the years. And um, this is a great time to be examining that. I know some of our corporate partners in town have always said, uh, if, you're, if you're a board member of a not-for-profit and you're not looking at taking on someone or being merged into someone, that's, you're not doing your responsibility right. There are gonna be some small ones in this situation uh, to keep their missions going, who makes sense to partner with somebody larger. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I'd encourage them to do that and um, you, in all cases, uh, a big one that we did 15 years ago, the Columbus Cancer Clinic, to give you an idea, we serve 40% more clients than they were serving at the time of the merger 15 years ago. And we do that with 40% less funding needs than 15 years ago. And the reason is you consolidate all those operations, things like that. Now we're all talking about employment here too, uh, because these are people that there might be less jobs, but I think the jobs with mergers change a little bit, mm -hmm. but they're still there. Mm -hmm. Almost every merger partner we've had, uh, the people that were working for them before the merger are still there after the merger, and they're still doing their, because they're doing direct service. I hate to sound like Miss Worst Case Scenario, but you have to be looking toward the end of the year and realizing this is getting worse. It's getting worse every week. It's oh, yeah. getting worse every month. Yep. So have you, can you even factor the possible numbers that you're going to be facing in yeah. the fourth quarter? Well, you have to because your boards are in not-for-profit world. You have a board and they're asking you those questions. So yes, we're trying to do that. And I, you know, it's um, what it is. I mean, you may have to, we all may have to turn people away. And that's, you know, that's gonna kill me, I'll just tell you. And, because uh, we haven't had to do that. And, uh, but we're, people are gonna be turned away. They're gonna be struggling to find help, things like that. Um, you know, I think we say a little prayer each night that a vaccine comes up. And I do believe, uh, this is just me, uh, I think we're a very innovative nation and world, and I think there's gonna be a vaccine by fall. I really do. What will do. that first day be like when you have to look someone in the eye and say, we can't help you? No, nah, it's gonna be ugly, ugly. I don't wanna do that. I think there are other things we can do if we all get together as agencies, which we're trying to do, um, and the United Way is a great convener for that and partner and say, hey, maybe I can't do it today, can you do it? Uh, sometimes that works out, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be ugly. Ugly. Yeah. Yeah. I see you nodding your head, Lisa. <laughs> you, are there going to be agencies that collapse or agencies that just cannot meet the need? Uh, and I, yes, I, um, people that know me uh, well know that I do believe that 
we probably have more nonprofits than we can afford and that we need. So I look at this as an opportunity for us to right size the sector, be really have the strongest organizations, the strongest strategies survive, um, and we'll be better for it. But it will be painful for our community to get there. This is a question that came from Metropolitan Club's YouTube. Which organizations have been best at meeting the needs of early education and childcare? Well, there are so many. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think about the Columbus Early Learning Centers and Southside Child Care uh, Center, um, you know, Future Ready's work in terms of advocacy. You know, the problem has been that uh, many of them, now over 200 of them, have become pandemic, pandemic child care centers. They've been seeing very low enrollment in those. So those are centers that would serve essential workers and their children. The enrollment has been low. That's another area where we've seen just lower than what we anticipated, right? I think if parents had a choice, they preferred to have their child at home and not take them to a pandemic center. But just this week, we heard a report that they were up to about 86% capacity. Mm -hmm. um, so those child care centers like run by the YMCA, YWCA, are, are very high performing. Mm -hmm. This question is from Juliet Doris Williams. Will the focus on our under-resourced neighbors continue after the crisis? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Hopefully more so. Yeah, more so. Yeah. And we'll have a bigger population of under-resourced neighbors, That's correct? Right. Correct. But yeah. the, uh, you know, to put an equity lens on this pandemic, we've just uh, been reminded of the disparities in our community. This is a long question, so hang in there with me. Uh, it's from Chris Cloth of Change Works of the Heartland. Federal and state tax cuts have resulted in reductions in government resources available for serving people most in need. Even the meager increases in some funding is nowhere near enough to meet the needs. It appears the government is trying to transfer funding of human services to the nonprofit and the faith communities while maintaining regulation of those services. In some cases, this risks transferring control of the nonprofit sector to major individual or corporate donors who may not understand the nuances of serving some populations effectively. What are your thoughts on the extent to which this observation may or may not be accurate? I had to read this question three times, so. Boy, I need my doctorate in this. Uh, yeah. I, I think when our current federal administration was elected, our current president, there was certainly some um, comments made. I know there was one made about Meals on Wheels at that time, uh, that there was a, you know, why should we fund this kind of thing? Um, all I can say is over the past couple years, I've seen that change. And um, they've changed their view on that. So I, th I think, um, you know, the problem is there's only so much money in the government. Pat T. Berry, when he was in U.S. Congress, uh, gave me a chart one time that the discretionary part of the United States budget uh, was like 55 percent of the budget back in the 80s. And now the discretionary part of the budget is getting teenier by the day because the mandated part of the budget, things like Social Security, Medicaid, uh, military, things like that, just keeps growing. And it's a circle, and he said it's almost like a Pac-Man situation. So the money, as he told me a couple of times, Chuck, the money just ain't gonna be there. It just ain't gonna be there. So uh, we've got to look at that. Now, I would tell you, though, uh, with this $2.2 trillion CARES Act, there appears to be some money. So, um, you know, that, that messes up the federal budget, though. So we're just gonna have to look at these things. But uh, they have stepped up, and I think, um, hopefully that never happens, because if it does, it'll be a disaster. And I have one more question. Toby Furman asks, can, you, can we hear more about uh, United Way's new kids program? Mm -hmm. Well, Toby, yes, thank you for that question. <laughs> <laughs> Toby runs the Arts Mobile. Yeah. Um, well, we are, we'll be announcing it soon, but it is uh, United for Kids, and it is about collecting um, from donors, 
and individuals who want to buy a hula hoop or crayons or coloring books, but we're putting packages together to serve families and administering them through our nonprofit partners that uh, serve the community. For example, settlement houses um, are a great means for us to reach people that would really benefit from something like this. And we would welcome your good guidance, Toby. We're almost out of time, but I just want each of you to leave us with a final thought on whether you are optimistic about this community meeting the nonprofit needs going forward. Well, I am an optimist um, every day. I am optimistic that we will give it our all. And Chuck? I'm, I'm optimistic, incredibly optimistic. This community has always stepped up, and what I've seen between the money and the volunteers the past two months is just incredible. What they have done to help all of us out, uh, it's, it's just like an army coming in. And, uh, and I'm optimistic, like I said, there's gonna be a vaccine and we'll get through this, and I think by Christmas we're gonna be pretty, we're gonna be sharing a beer, Colleen. <laughs> I can't wait for Christmas, Chuck. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Well, Reality and, and optimism, I think, get balanced today. Um, I know that's sort of the way we're operating at the Metropolitan Club these days, reality balanced with optimism. I heard words like blessed. I heard words like tsunami. Um, but they were balanced with community strength and uh, the highest volunteer rate ever, creativity. I heard words like remarkable. And there's, it's clear that there is a committed and dedicated group of professionals and volunteers that are here to take care of us and our community, so we're grateful for that. We hope you'll tune in next Wednesday at noon for a very interesting conversation with Dr. Hal Paz. He's Executive Vice President, Chancellor for Health Affairs at Ohio State and CEO of the OSU Wexner Medical Center. And he'll be joined on stage by uh, Louis Lou Von Thayer, who's President and CEO of Patel. We're grateful for the support today for this forum from the Crane Group and Grange Insurance, as well as our live streaming partners, NBC4, NBC4i, WOSU Public Media, PNC, the Tom E. Daly Foundation, Borpsy, the Columbus Dispatch, and the OSU Wexner Medical Center. And thank you very much to our speakers, Dr. Lisa Cordes, Chuck Gehring, and our very own Colleen Marshall. Thanks for those of you who purchased virtual seats for today's forum. We are truly grateful. We hope to see you in person soon, but, in the, but until then, please stay well and stay safe.